That's uh, T-Rex and uh, Jeepster, selected by my My 70s guest this afternoon, uh, Leslie Ann Jones, who's had a very quiet, kind of ordinary, uh, fairly easy life. Uh, things like an ongoing battle with skin cancer, peritonitis, meningitis, life-death surgery, having the last rites read over her, miscarriage, swine flu, held at gunpoint in Tobago, kidnapped in Los Angeles, arrested outside her own house and locked overnight in a police cell. Uh, she's brought up uh, three kids on her own. And uh, I guess the kidnapping in Los Angeles was when she was kidnapped by Ozzy Osbourne. So the difficulty is we've got nothing to talk about. It's a shame, isn't it? It yes. always happens, Johnny, this, doesn't it? It's so nice to be sitting opposite you in a studio well, as it's... opposed to behind a wheel of a car on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> listening in. Right, well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Liz has also written biographies of Freddie Mercury, David Bowie, Mark Bolan, and uh, has released a great book called Tumbling Dice, uh, reliving the glory days of free, uh, Fleet Street celebrity journalism. And uh, there was a wonderful series on BBC, which sadly is not available on the iPlay, called, simply called Press. Did you see that? I saw it. I was glued to it. I thought it was brilliant. It took a lot of hits, didn't it? People didn't really seem to like it. And, so, and some journalists said, this is not authentic. I thought it was. It was exactly the life that I lived, minus the technology, which we didn't have, of course, in my day. Because you worked for the notorious... Kelvin, Freddie ate my hamster, Mackenzie. <laughs> I did for my sins. Cal yeah. Calvin had seen me on television and offered me a column, sort of your girl about town, kind of my life that week. You know, it was uh, everything I did. It was really just writing about clubs and dancing and my friends. And I got away with it for a while. And then I thought I was saved by the Daily Mail, but it was much worse down there. Yeah, I know that sort of surprised me. It was out of the frying pan and into the fire. Absolutely. I, right. I mean, it was a hotbed of goons and desperation and making stuff up. Even the editor was inventing stories. And if we didn't have a splash for the next day, it would be, OK, everybody over the wine press, what can just, we... Just tell us what a splash is. OK, a splash is, is the front page headline story, you know, that, that, that carries the paper yeah. on the day. So we wouldn't have one, everybody over the wine bar, and we'd sit around and literally they would make stories up. Oh, Elton John's having an affair with Princess Margaret. And it would be uh, so-and-so, get on the phone to Dickie at the palace and you know get a quote uh la that was me get down to windsor and terrorize the old poofter as they called him in those <laughs> days and the story would emerge and, and what you would get would be a denial so then you would have the headline the next day elton john denied last night comma so you'd have a story anyway yeah it's outrageous, isn't it? Isn't it? It was the phrase, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. That was actually used a lot. Liberty Valance, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, yeah. But it's true. So your life changed, as I see it from the book, uh, in a big way in 1973, when you sort of really discovered music. So what happened? Who... A little bit earlier than that, maybe. It... 71, I think, I, I sort of woke up to music. I, I coasted along. I was a bit too late for the Beatles. So I discovered the Beatles backwards. I came in at Macca and then Wings. And I, Ram was my big record of 1971. I played it to death. And the boy next door, who was about seven years older than me, I fancied like mad. He came around one day with a copy of Imagine. He said, try this. And so then I, I kind of discovered the other Beatles, but especially John. But I didn't really go for that title track. There was something else on that album that really caught my eye and okay. my ear. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec. Did you meet John Lennon? I never did. Tragically, I never did. But I've met Paul a few times. I've met Ringo several times. George, I didn't meet either. But I'm not sure how I, I sort of missed... Because I've got friends the same age as me who seem to be dancing around the playground to Beatles hits. Now, why wasn't that me? But all my record choices of today would come from 71, apart from one, which comes from 72. So 71 was the year I was reading the sleeve notes on the back of albums. And I didn't just want to know where they were recorded. I wanted to know who drove the cars, who was the T-boy, you know, what other stuff was going on. So when I ended up working at Chrysalis Records for a while, writing sleeve notes, I already knew the score. I knew what went into those because I'd been doing them. Right. So was 71 the year when you traded your... Lady Penelope, Pink Rolls Royce for a turntable. <laughs> Pretty much. It went off in the loft. Yeah. And my parents' house might still be there, actually. I need to have a look. <laughs> All right. So that track from John Lennon's Imagine album is what? Which one? It's a track called How. 
And it seemed to me that John was listening in on all our sort of tween age angst, if you like. It's, it's a series of questions that start out in the fir- first person, how can I? But by the end of the song, he's asking, how can we? And I think he's answered his main question, which is, I can't do this all by myself, but I can do this with somebody else. OK, here it is. How can I go forward when I don't know which way I'm facing? John Lennon and How from the Imagine album, chosen by our guest Leslie Ann Jones. Um, you collaborated with Cynthia Lennon, John's first wife, didn't you, to do a book? I did. I, in fact, I first collaborated with Linda McCartney on a book that I uh, came up with a title and she just loved it. It was going to be called Mac the Wife. And we worked together for about four months on this. And I was down at the McCartney house in Peasmosh, sitting at the kitchen table, working away with Linda, and Paul came in. And they went outside and had a little chat and she came back in and she was quite tearful and said, Paul doesn't want me to do this. Apparently there was only one star in that family. You know, I'm a big Macca fan, so I'm not criticising him. But similar thing happened with Cynthia. We started working on another book because she'd done one previously, but she wanted to update her story. And I think she was very short of money at the time and she was trying all kinds of enterprises like a nightclub in St Martin's Lane, do you remember? And a a range of bed linen and perfume and all kinds of stuff. And I think she just ran out of steam in the end. Yeah. My wife, Tiggy, had a similar idea for ages and would love to have done a book about Behind Every Great Man because these are usually the women um, who are fascinating people. Sometimes they like to stay hidden. Other times, I think it would be great to lift a little bit and hear what they have to say. Cherchez la femme, isn't it? But I mean, it's just a shame about the Linda book, especially because she's died, obviously, and that story can never be told, that Beatle wife from her point of view. But what was it that upset Paul, do you think? Was it, was it that had he seen part of what you'd written? No, he hadn't. It was just the idea well, no, of we, Linda having some, no. some spotlight. I think it was literally that he preferred the star to be him. Mm. What have you found out that uh, stars and celebrities have in common as people? They, are they are yeah. they are they desperate to be loved? Are they insecure? I mean, what what do they have in common? Almost universally, there is an inner angst, a void, something that needs to be filled. There's some dysfunction from childhood or from an early part of of their life that they haven't managed to fulfil in some way. So the, it is a craving, it is a desperation to be loved, and they need the adulation and they need the pain. If they fill the void, if they're successful in healing that part of themselves. They can no longer create, so they need to go on being in pain. It's a conundrum, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember uh, somebody saying about a certain member of a band who were playing in uh, Wembley tonight, the Eagles, that said, there you go, they've broken another heart, so they'll have another song to write about. Exactly. Um, so you have met David Bowie, you know, very early on. Were you, were you a fan that found out where he lived and kind of, you know, hung outside the house? I was that fan, yeah. Well, he, he was a local hero, you know, the best kind. And Spain, This is in where? Beckenham? This is Beckenham in Kent. I was yeah. in Bromley. He went to school in Bromley like me. And, and so Space Oddity came along and the BBC picked it up as the soundtrack for the moon landings. So suddenly, after 10 years of desperately trying to, to be a star, he was now a star very briefly. Then it went away again and came back again in sort of 72, 73, didn't it? But we had to find out where he lived and we got on the 227 bus at the Market Square that he wrote about in his songs and went down to Beckenham up South End Road and, and to Haddon Hall where he lived. And he, interesting, he, he was living with Tony Visconti who was producing Mark Bolan at that time uh, but sharing a house with Bowie. So there was this eternal triangle. And David was furious with Mark for being famous before he was because as far as David was concerned, he was trying much longer and couldn't give it away. But, yeah, we used to knock on the door and Angie would give us signed photos and tell us to go home to our mothers. And I said to my friend Natasha, one day she's going to be out and he's going to answer the door and he's going to have us in for tea. And that's what happened. (laughs) And he was wearing a yellow silk kimono and he was painting his fingernails with black polish. He didn't have a brush, so he was doing it with a cocktail stick. Come on in, he said, he's barefoot, and we lay around on cushions looking really cool, we thought. And he made us tea, had no milk. And we talked about Hair, the musical that he failed to, to get it into. 
and about goods and, you know, spacecraft and all this weird stuff. and Aliens. Aliens. Did he believe in aliens? He did. Yeah. Well, he said he did, anyway. He said yeah. a lot of things, didn't he? But there was a silver ceiling and, and bottle green walls and velvet, red velvet sofas. And I looked around and I thought, I've got to grow up and be with people like this. But how? I wasn't musical. I wasn't artistic. I had nothing to bring to the party. But my dad was a sports writer, having broken his Achilles tendon when he was a footballer professional footballer so had to find another gig and suddenly all the pennies dropped one day I thought I could do that I could do what he did almost go on the road with bands and write about them so I knew at a very early age what I was going to do right and uh, you must have been proposition quite a lot oh yeah yeah uh-huh. Especially if you're writing and somebody men, wants huh? it to be good, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, men. <laughs> who were, who was the worst between chefs and rock stars? Oh gosh, I mean, the don't chefs, name any names. The chefs came right out with it, didn't they? In no uncertain terms. But Tiggy told me I'm not allowed to swear on air, so I'm not going to tell you what he said. <laughs> but uh, yeah, rock stars were generally quite well behaved. It was their entourages who thought they could have a little go at us, you know, but but we were big, strong girls, Johnny. Yeah. Now, you would do what, uh, you, you know, you're not supposed to do in that you give the interviewee copy approval. Sometimes I So, in other I words, did, you yeah. would show them what was going to be in the paper so they could object to something. Big sin, that. No, you're always, not supposed to do that. Nah, and it always backfires. Yeah. Because it, it breaks the transaction between, between the journalist and the and the newspaper and the artist you're writing about. Uh, it takes away the integrity of journalism. But once or twice, because those people were my friends, I decided to extend them that, um, that liberty, and it always went wrong. Yeah. Because uh, very often they would approve the copy, but then somebody who would come up with the headline... And uh, this happens a lot, I think. There's a most awful headline put on the story. And the person who wrote the story is not responsible for the headline, are they? You get no say in that. So you've got your inky-fingered maniacs, as we used to call them, on the back bench, you know, creating these horrid headlines because, obviously, they just want to sell papers. They don't care. And then the pictures might be compromising as well. And then the advertising people have a go, so they want the space for the ads. So there's always a fight going on between advertising and the editorial, and your piece gets cut, cut, cut down to, to the bare minimum sometimes. But in the end, journalism is only about finding stuff out. Well, I mentioned press, and there's a great scene in press, and it's been in other films too, when the actual newspaper presses start rolling. And you say you could feel it in the building, could you? So in press, obviously, it was uh, it's a digital world, isn't it? So everything is, is done uh, with greater technology than we had. We had old-fashioned printing presses underneath the newspaper offices, underneath the pavement. And when the presses would start to roll sort of around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening uh, for the first editions, which had to then go onto trucks and be driven as far north and as far west and as far east and so on, you would feel the pavements shudder as you walk down Fleet Street. You could smell the ink in the air. You could feel that smut on your face. You know, you'd go home and have a wash and, and it would be black uh, in your hands when the, when the water came away. It was a filthy place, you know, in, in, in more ways than one. But it was so exciting, though, wasn't it? Thrill, absolute thrill. I still go to Fleet Street quite a lot. Cause my church is down there, St Brides, and I'm up and down there all the time. And it isn't the same. You know, that vibe is missing. Mm -hmm. In the old days, it was a village and people would congregate. Each newspaper had its own pub. And so sometimes you would trespass into another newspaper's pub. And sometimes we would collaborate, which was completely against the law, with other journalists to try and contrive stories and sometimes work on the same thing. It's a fascinating world. Um, We've been talking about David Bowie. Which song would you pick from him? So David Bowie, I always come back to Hunky Dory as my favourite album. It didn't really go stratospheric, did it, until after the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, and then it stuck around for ages. There's a track on there which we all thought was us when we were cocky little girls and we didn't know a thing about life or love or anything else, but we all thought we were the queen bitches. And there was even a reference to a character in that song called Flo, and Flo was my nickname at the Westwickham St Francis of Assisi Youth Club. So where that came from, I don't know. We did not have any idea that the song was about transvestite prostitutes. Had we known, you know, my mother would have taken it away from me. But it's a great (laughs) song, isn't it? 
Also, we could dedicate it to all Bowie fans, but especially the people of one particular town, which is what I found out from reading your book, that David Bowie loved Margate. Oh, did he love Margate? And I said, partly grew up there because my grandparents lived there. But he, he did a season down there, almost a residency in his old mod days. And he actually played pitch and putt on the little putting green by the station opposite the sea with my granddad, who'd been a very famous footballer. He'd played for Everton in his day, Emlyn Jones or Mickey, as they called him. And that was my claim to fame when I was young, that my granddad played a round of pitch and pot with David Bowie. (laughs) David Bowie and Queen Bitch, uh, selected by my 70s guest, uh, journalist, writer, Leslie Leslie Ann Jones. Um, Great to hear that, because that doesn't often get played. No, it doesn't. They go for the more obvious tracks, don't they? Life on Mars and so on from, from that album. But, yeah, it deserves an airing every now and yeah. again. Do you think David Bowie came from another planet? No, he, li- he, he would have liked like- to. <laughs> yeah, he did look like that, didn't he? But he was very ordinary. What I loved about him, because I met him when I was so young, he never changed from that David. I bumped into him again when I was a student in Paris a few years later. I'd had no hair the first time I met him because I'd had quite a bad illness and I, my hair had fallen out. And then when I, I saw him again in Paris a few years later and the first thing he said to me was, yeah, Barnet grew back then. <laughs> and uh, then I, when I saw him again, it was, oh, you again. And that became his little phrase for me every time I saw him. And when I was travelling to and from New York a lot in the 80s and 90s, I would bump into him. We might have dinner or, or lunch or whatever. You again was always the phrase. But he always stayed the same David. He didn't change. You might see a version of David on TV or in, in an interview somewhere and he'd be putting it on. You know, he had a few personas, didn't he? He liked to bring those out. But when he was with us, people who knew him from before, as he used to say, from the old days, before he was anyone, he was just the same David as he always was. I loved that about him. Do you remember that day when you saw Starman on top of the Pops? Oh, wow. Yeah, who could forget? Yeah. That was life-changing, wasn't it? It really was. Yeah. And then you were at the Hammersmith Odeon for the famous gig where he said, that's it. Didn't tell my mum. We went on the train from Bromley South in our school uniform, got changed. Do you remember when trains had little corridors and you could close the doors of the inside compartments and pull the blinds down, which we did, and got changed into our gear with platform (laughs) boots, blue leather with DB initials in paper clips all up the side (laughs) and went to the gig. And everything you read about that gig was absolutely true. And, of course, when he said, not only is this the last gig of the tour, but this is the last show we will ever do, everybody thought, oh, no, he's never going to play again. They thought that was it, David Bowie hanging up his platform boots. But, of course, he didn't mean that. He meant the spiders. And only Mick Ronson, the guitarist, knew in advance that this was going to happen. Everybody else was getting their P45 on stage on the night. It was horrific. I mean, Tony Visconti said even his death was the way he exited this, this world was artistic. I mean, it was quite amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. There was... I mean, he released a new album. Released a new album. Then it was his birthday. And then two days later, he died. Almost as if he'd planned it, which he couldn't have done. Because I know, knowing the kind of man that David was, that he wouldn't have risked the, the... the liberty of any member of his family by involving them in his death in any way. He must have just decided to check out at that point. Mm. Great timing. Yeah. Uh, And it was a huge... It was was a massive shock, wasn't it? It, I mean, really, I can remember the day. People were sitting on buses and trains and things, going to work, missing their stops. They are all having headphones on, listening to Bowie. Yeah. People are in a complete state of shock. I got an email from a friend who was a hedge funder in New York, a Japanese friend of mine. It was about five in the morning and she, she sent me this message. Did you hear David Bowie died? And I said, no, I didn't even know he was ill. Not really. I mean, there were rumours, weren't there, for quite a few years. And I immediately jumped out of bed. I went up to the top of the house, two, two floors up, and woke up my daughter, my eldest, who had been with me at his house in Mystique, which he lent me to write my first Freddie Mercury book. And I woke her up and I said, David Bowie's dead. And we we both just cried. We cried and cried. What else do you do? Mm. Um, You've written this book that's been a huge success all over the world, topped the sales charts in many countries, uh, the book about Freddie Mercury. 
So did you ever meet Freddie? Yeah, I did. I went on four tours with Queen uh, while I was still a journalist on Fleet Street. And I think I became their pet journalist for a while. You know, they would test people and have you down to the offices in Notting Hill. And in those days, it was Brian and Freddie used to give the interviews. And Freddie never used to say very much. He'd sit curled up in the window with his arms wrapped around his legs and if Brian said something funny and he would laugh his hand would fly to his mouth because he didn't want you to see his teeth <laughs> and he was a funny little thing really really small guy, not much bigger than me but he was one of those artists, he would go out on stage and he would treble in size and he would command an audience of 100,000 people or more in some of the South American venues and then when he came off at the end of the show, he would reduce back down and take the stardom off the way you take an overcoat off. And it didn't go to his head, not at any stage. He could be pompous and he could be bitchy and he could be impatient and, and all the things that we all are as humans, you know, but they're exaggerated because you're an artist, I suppose. But he was just a normal guy and he liked to laugh. Yeah. It's amazing, that thing you describe. I've seen it before with other artists, and they look giants on stage and so commanding and of such presence. And then sometimes we get, you know, we're invited backstage to meet them after the show, and, then, and they're tiny. Humble as hell as yeah. well. Making a cup of tea. Ooh, yeah. cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Something stronger. Yeah. So why did Ozzy Osbourne kidnap you in L.A.? Oh, wow, they had a downer on the press at the time. I, I'm sure you remember this story when Ozzy went missing. And I think he had about four little children and Sharon was there sort of trying to run his career and look after these little kids. And he went missing. And it was all over the papers. Where has Ozzy gone? You know, and the next thing she got in the post, a shoebox with his hair in it, because he had quite long hair, and he'd cut the hair off, or someone had, and he'd sent it to Sharon in a shoebox. So the whole world is going mad for this story, and you can imagine Fleet Street was having a heyday. Just, just exaggeration city. It was wonderful. And... I was in conversation with Ozzy. We'd become quite good friends. One of the editors overheard me talking to him on the phone, on the old-fashioned dog and bone, you know, in those days, and came in and said, right, you know where he is. You're going to go and get an exclusive. And I said, I can't do that because he doesn't want to do it. So they sent me. I had to go, otherwise I'm going to get sacked. So I, I knew he was in L.A. because they had a house in Los Angeles. So off I go to see Ozzy and I rocked up and we went out for dinner. Rod Stewart came with us as well. And we went to a restaurant called Metzaluna, quite a famous place. How do you do all this? I mean, you know, you, 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 you're... A, <laughs> I know you're not a deliberate name dropper, but you got... So I went to L.A. Rod Stewart came along for dinner. How well, does all did. this happen? I don't know. Is this because you're a journalist and you can give them I press think, or what? OK, this is was in the age when what happened on the road stayed on the road. If you were a trustworthy journalist, as Queen had sort of found me to be, and they could invite you along to review the shows, do the interviews, but not write anything else. Nobody gets away with that now. But in those days, we could and we did become friends with the artists. And But then you... See, you, you, you see. That, that hampers your role as a journalist, to tell it like it is. I bit. thought that immediately when you said I became Queen's favourite journalist. I thought, well, that's maybe because you didn't write anything bad about them. The moment you did, you'd be out. Exactly. You wouldn't get invited on the next tour. In fact, I think their favourite journalist was always David Wiggs. I was just the pet one, really. You know, they could rely on me for, for good quotes and, yeah. and stuff. But as rock writers, as music journalists and celebrity interviewers, we weren't mainstream journalists as such. We weren't there to do up the dirt. So we're, we're not like front page reporters. OK, so we're back in L.A. We're yeah, out we're to in dinner L.A. With, we're at Metzalina. We're out to dinner with Rod. So, so Rod comes up with an idea that we have to pay $10 for every garment that we're wearing, at which point clothes start to come off in the restaurant and get stuffed into bags. And I remember Ozzy being wrapped in a tablecloth under the table with a red rose in his mouth, waving a $10 bill, going, I'm paying no more than this, chaps. <laughs> and then one thing led to another. How did you find him, though? Because he's supposed to have disappeared. He's in his house. But I don't think Sharon thought to look there. No, she went to New York. She, she didn't, didn't think to look in the house. Well, you know, you know. It's a long time ago. Right. So they had a den in the house and they thought after copious amounts of alcohol that it might be a good idea to take a hostage uh, just to show their disgust for the British press at this point. So I was the hostage. And Ozzy cooked us lobster 
for for supper the next night. Um, Not bad fruit for a hostage. No, but he got they were live lobsters, and he's this is awful. Actually, I've hated this ever since. It still gives me nightmares. He was dropping the lobsters into boiling water on the stove. Were they wriggling? He was saying that he loved to hear them scream. Wow. Do they? I didn't listen. Hands over ears, just. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some friends, uh, Steve and Anna are over from Tresco and we've been over there and there's a lovely thing you can do. There's a family that runs fish business from another island called Briar and you can call them up and order what fish you want and uh, they'll, at five o'clock you go down to the pier on Tresco and I shouldn't be mentioning this because it's so delightful, we don't want too many people to go <laughs> but this little fishing boat will come chugging over with uh, fresh lobster or crab or whatever it is that you'd ordered. And we'd always say, well, you, you know, they'd say, do you want the lobster cooked? And you you go, yes, please. And then my wife's brother, who's a chef, comes out, oh, no, 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 I want it live. And we said, well, what are you going to do? You're going to bang it on the head in the house or what? He said, no, you just put it in the freezer. And they just go to sleep. Well, you know... <laughs> That's gross. Oh, well, no. it, so you're actually is. eating a live half sleep lobster? That's disgusting. <laughs> That's worse than Ozzy Osbourne. Anyway, so your kidnap pretty freed you after yeah, a while. Yeah, they let me go. But yeah. I, uh, my mum was worried for a couple of days. But just one last question, because um, I mean, we could talk for ages. Because you've got so many great stories. Going back to press, there was a scene where they both turn up at this uh, trailer park. They want to interview somebody. Doesn't really want to be interviewed. And there's two journalists, each from the rival newspapers. And uh, the one journalist says to this uh, female journalist, oh, I've been in there, is refusing to talk. You know, there's not a story, there's nothing we can do. You know, do you want to lift back to the station? So he drops her at the station and thinking she's going to get on a train back to London. And then he scurries back to the trailer park because he'd done a deal with this guy, then let him in to give him the story. But she... Not being a, you know, she saw the reckon that something was up. She reappears. So, what tricks did you pull on other journalists to make sure they didn't get the story that you did? Oh, loads of tricks. I mean, there was a lot of end of peer in those days. So, uh, dressing up. For example, I remember dressing up as a London zookeeper and we rented a chimpanzee from London Zoo. You couldn't get away with that now because health and safety animal whatever, you know, protection. But we rented a monkey. Michael Jackson was staying at the Dorchester and down we go to Regent's Park to pick up this monkey and get to the Dorchester and go to the private lift to, that goes all the way up to the penthouse and actually got as far as the door for, for Michael Jackson's suite before somebody rumbled us. We dressed up as nurses. I remember when I was massively pregnant with my first child laying in wait for Madonna dressed as a janitor in the back entrance to the hotel while she was having a run around the park and she saw straight through my disguise the minute she came in but I got the interview yeah, um, yeah and that, lots of things but do you ever was, feel a bit ashamed about no, some of the tricks you've done no there were far worse things going on I, I, I didn't really break the law although I did get arrested a few times yeah and what about the journalist's right to know which is very topical at the moment the, the news headlines will be dominated by one story public interest do we have a right to know about I think so. people's private lives? I think Why? if they might impact on the personality of the individual in question and have some effect on their ability to do their job, yeah, I think we have a right to know. OK. Well, listen, uh, time defeats us. It's been great chatting with you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for being our guest. Uh, Leslie Ann Jones, her book is called Tumbling Dice. It's out now. And uh, there's a couple of appearances that Leslie Ann is doing. She'll be guest on the 8 o'clock Rock Chat series, which is taking place at the Half Moon Putney uh, in London on the 28th of July. That's at 3 p.m. And at the Comedia Club in Brighton on the 1st of August at 8 o'clock. Tickets available from the venues and online at Music Majors website. And we haven't had time to talk about Bill Wyman, who you got to know quite well. Oh, we'd better do that another time, haven't we? <laughs> we had... Maybe over a drink, Johnny. <laughs> Maybe. But uh, a Rolling Stones track, which is it to be? It's going to be Tumbling Dice from my favourite Stones album, arguably the best album they ever made, uh, Exile on Main Street, recorded mainly in the south of France, wasn't it, in, and released in 1972. This song is about risk and it's about taking chances, which we all really have to do every day of our lives. And Bill Wyman, the Bill Wyman we'd see on stage, the sort of motionless, expressionless 
bass player, which, like a lot of them are, John Entwistle was the same. Uh, how did that compare with the real Bill Wyman? Well, so motionless, he's not even on this track playing bass, by the way, which is Isn't funny. He? No, no, he's not. But uh, you know, Bill wasn't the most animated person, you'd have to say. And I think he's probably become less so as, as the years have ticked away. But I don't get that he's missed being away from the road with the Stones for the past 30 years. Of course he does, is what you're saying. Of course he does. Yeah. Because they tour in style, don't they? Yeah, they do, and I'm so glad they're back on the road as well. Yeah. All right, thanks again. Thank you, Johnny. Bye. Bye-bye.